Hello, and thank you for joining me today. I am Amy Rolfson. I'm a naturopathic doctor and a member of the medical education team here at Diagnostic Solutions Lab. Today, I'll be sharing a case study with you that will be the first in a series of case studies designed to help you build your clinical interpretation skills of the GI map. I chose today's case because it gives a great example of when low-level H. pylori can be clinically significant. I get so many questions daily about low-level H. pylori and what to do with it or whether to do anything at all with it that I thought it would be a good idea to start here for our cases. And this isn't meant to be a deep dive into H. pylori. There is so much to know about this interesting organism that today we'll just be scratching the surface. One of the great strengths of the GI map test is that it detects H. pylori with amazing sensitivity. We'll be picking up H. pylori with quantitative PCR as low as 10 organisms per gram of stool. This means that we will be picking up H. pylori at low, low levels that may not be clinically relevant. The art then comes with determining which cases of H. pylori are worth treating and which are worth leaving. And any of you that practice functional or individualized medicine will realize that the, the range, the optimal functional range for each individual person will vary. So what do I mean when I say low level H. pylori? I'm talking about any H. pylori that is detected but not flagged as high. The GM app will flag any value that falls over 1E3 or 1,000 organisms per gram of stool. After reviewing many, many tests, I can say with confidence that it is quite common for H. pylori to be clinically significant below that level. This means that even at low levels detected in the stool, a patient may be negatively affected by H. pylori infection. But not all H. pylori needs to be treated. It's estimated that roughly half of the human population has H. pylori present, but only 15% of those people who have it present will develop, not symptoms, but will develop disease like an ulcer or gastric cancer. H. pylori has been evolving with humans for ages, and there is evidence that it can actually be symbiotic. And whether H. pylori acts as a pathogen or a symbiont will depend on complicated bacterium host interactions. So essentially, the same strain of H. pylori could affect two people very differently, depending on terrain conditions, local immune response, as well as the particular variant of H. pylori that may be present. And the decision of whether to treat H. pylori will be personal, and it really comes down to clinical decision-making and patient values. Some clinicians will choose to treat H. pylori every time it is present, while others will only treat it if it's out of the reference range or if virulence factors are present. So when I'm looking at a case of low level H. pylori, here are the things that I'm considering to determine whether it will be significant for treatment or not. First, I'm looking at virulence factors. These are genes that can be found in the H. pylori genome. They're associated with greater incidence of pathology such as gastric and duodenal ulcers, and very rarely gastric cancer. On the GI map, we're measuring eight different virulence factors. So here's an example of what it looks like when virulence factors are present. When I see these showing up on the test, I will treat the H. pylori every time. And I usually move a bit quicker into treatment, and sometimes I'll adapt my treatment slightly. Here on the GI map, virulence factors are reflexed if H. pylori is found at levels above 5E2, or 500 organisms per gram of stool. Next, I'm looking at upper GI symptoms, like upper GI pain and reflux that are classically associated with H. pylori infection, with or without ulcers. I'm also asking about autoimmune conditions, because H. pylori can contribute to a large number of autoimmune conditions. And clinically, I see a huge correlation between H. pylori and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I'm also looking at downstream effects of H. pylori. And what I mean by that is that H. pylori can have effects outside the stomach. Speaking specifically about the GI tract, often we'll see symptoms linked to digestive insufficiency. H. pylori produces the enzyme urease, which acts locally to neutralize the stomach acid. Depending on the concentration of H. pylori present, this can have a significant effect on gastric pH and gut environment. We frequently see widespread dysbiosis secondary to H. pylori. Clinically, we can also see symptoms suggesting nutrient malabsorption. 
On the GI map, the most common findings secondary to H. pylori are going to be overgrowth. And on page two, we'll see overgrow overgrowth fairly frequently of the Clostridia class and Acromantia, and also the Firmicutes phylum will overgrow fairly frequently. On page three, we'll see overgrowth of Bacillus, Enterococcus, Staph and Strep, or any combination of the above. And then on page four of the GI map, we'll often see low elastase. There are some other organisms, organisms that we frequently see secondary to H. pylori, um, like bacteria, and sometimes on the pathogen page, we'll often see enterohemorrhagic E. coli, and we'll see a lot of the parasites present with H. pylori. I'm asking every patient about personal history of H. pylori. If your patient has had H. pylori in the past and it has been treated, yet the organism is still present, that's very significant. Usually when patients come to see us with a history of H. pylori, it was found because they have had very significant GI symptoms. They will usually have gone through either triple or quadruple therapy, and it's worth distinguishing which therapy they were on. If your patient is fuzzy on their history, ask if they remember taking antibiotics eight times daily. Usually that will stick out in their memory and that will have been quadruple therapy. It would be worth your time to figure out what has already been done because you'll want to either choose a completely new protocol or tweak the original protocol to account for that treatment resistance history. Moving on, there are a few other things to consider when deciding whether or not to treat H. pylori. So the higher the concentration we see on the GI map, the more likely the H. pylori will be significant. With a cutoff of 1,000 organisms, a value of 9E2, or 900 organisms, will be much more significant than a value of 1E1, or 10 organisms. So look carefully at the quantitation. Knowing whether a family member has significant H. pylori or is being currently treated for H. pylori can inform our decision of whether or not to treat. We do know that H. pylori can be easily transmitted from person to person. And when I say that low level H. pylori is significant for treatment, I don't necessarily mean with antibiotics. H. pylori can be very effectively treated using natural products. I have the luxury of seeing many GI MAP tests before and after treatment. And from what I can tell, there is roughly equal success in eradicating H. pylori using botanicals as with antibiotics. And here's one more very important concept. The decision to treat low level H. pylori is not urgent. If you aren't sure whether the H. pylori may be contributing to symptoms, and if there aren't virulence factors present, there is no reason you would need to decide right away whether or not to treat the H. pylori. You could very reasonably treat the rest of the findings on the test first. Then, if the patient doesn't respond as expected to treatment, or if the patient responds well and then relapses, you could come back to considering treating that H. pylori. Often we will see H. pylori being implicated in recurrent bacterial overgrowth, like those really, really stubborn SIBO cases that get better and then just keep coming back. So let's take a look at this case. This is a 36-year-old female of South Asian descent who came to see me with a chief concern of gnawing upper abdominal pain, accompanied by constipation and bloating, pretty much constantly, and it was really affecting her quality of life. She also had persistent fatigue, premenstrual changes that were verging on PMDD, and hair loss. She leads a very fast-paced life and has an extremely demanding job. She had already had a gastroenterology workup, including colonoscopy, which was normal. She had not had an upper endoscopy, nor had she had an H. pylori test that she was aware of. She presented with basic blood work, which showed alternating high and low ferritin, high ANA titers, and a persistently low MCH. So we decided to do some testing. So we repeated her blood work and ferritin. We added on a full thyroid assessment, I checked a whole bunch of autoimmune markers, and I also added on a hemoglobin electrophoresis to check out for thalassemias, since in the South Asian population, thalassemias are more prevalent, and she did have that low MCH. And of course, I ordered the GI map to assess her gut health and her microbiome. I was suspecting H. pylori might come up here. And so let's take a look at her lab work. Um, so all of the autoimmune markers that we ran came back normal, except for the repeat ANA titers, which came back quite high. 
the thyroid assessment came back normal and within my optimal range. And the hemoglobin electrophoresis came back positive for alpha thalassemia, which could certainly be contributing to her fatigue. Now let's go over her GI map results because there were a lot of interesting findings in this case. I'm gonna go through it in detail so you can see just how I interpret the test as a whole. So here on page one, we can see that she's negative for any pathogens, which is wonderful. On page two, we see that she has H. pylori present and below the reference range. But she's not very far below the, the edge of the reference range, is she? She is here at 9.3 E2, or 930 organisms per gram of stool, and we cut the reference range off at 1,000. So she's actually quite high. So she's very close to that statistically significant level, but is her H. pylori clinically significant? Let's go through that list of questions we were, we were asking before. Does she have virulence factors? No, she's negative for all the virulence factors. Does she have upper GI symptoms? Yes, very significant. Does she have an autoimmune condition? Well, she doesn't have a specific autoimmune diagnosis, but she does have high ANA titers, so I would give her that one. Does she have a personal history with H. pylori? No. And does she have any evidence of downstream effects of H. pylori? Well, she has a history of dysfunctional ferritin levels, fatigue and hair loss, so it's very possible she has issues with malabsorption. As for the other signs, let's look through the test and see what we find. So when I look at the normal flora, I like to start by assessing the phyla microbiota, and this gives us an, an idea about total abundance of normal flora. Often with H. pylori present, you will see the Firmicutes phylum overgrown, but here we see that she's normal. And so let's look above this thin black line where we see that Clostridia is deficient and Acromantia mucinophila is actually below detection limit. And be careful in this normal flora section to look for these below detection limits because they are not flagged in yellow in this section. So Clostridia we know when it's low can be associated with autoimmune conditions and inflammation. Acromantia, when it's below detection limit, what we see clinically is often um, either mucosal insufficiency, like gut lining dysfunction, or we'll see something in the range of intestinal permeability. So both of these findings could be very significant in this case. Let's take a look at page three and see what we see here. So here on page three, we do see some overgrowth that looks fairly classic for what we often see secondary to H. pylori. Here we see bacillus, enterococcus, all present or overgrown, and we see strep overgrown. Often with H. pylori, we will also see staph overgrown, but here we don't see it. And so this could be significant as, as overgrowth secondary to H. pylori. And I also always look to Methanobacteriaceae in cases involving constipation. Methanobacteriaceae is a normal expected finding on the GI map. And here at about 2E7, the low E7 range, this appears to be a very normal number. So I don't think this value is likely to be contributing much to this patient's constipation. Moving down to the potential autoimmune triggers, we see that there is some growth of Klebsiella pneumoniae, Prevotella, and Fusobacterium. And we know that Prevotella and Fusobacterium are normal and expected findings on the GI map. And this is just about the level I expect to see them. Klebsiella, however, is not an expected finding. It has the potential to produce histamines and biofilms and can be quite inflammatory. It is an autoimmune trigger and is often associated with autoimmune conditions related to joints. At this level, I don't suspect it would be doing many of these things to a large degree, but I think she's better off without it, especially since she has positive ANA titers. When I'm looking at page three overgrowth, I'm always looking down the row at the number to the right of the E and comparing it to the number to the right of the E in the normal range. And here we see that all the overgrown organisms are within an order of magnitude of the reference range. And since there are only a few organisms overgrown here, I would call this a mild overgrowth. When H. pylori is present and we see a mild overgrowth, I often won't treat the bacterial overgrowth directly because I have seen that the combination of treating H. pylori, addressing digestive insufficiency, and potentially working on motility can correct these numbers nicely. So for this patient, 
I wouldn't be using an antimicrobial specifically for the findings on page three. So moving on, we don't see any other organisms growing on the test. And let's take a look at intestinal health. The first marker, steatocrit, is telling us about fat absorption. And here at below detection limit is right where I like to see it. This tells us that she is digesting her fats nicely. The next marker, elastase 1, is a measure of pancreatic enzyme output. And she's actually quite low here. I like to use a functional range of 500. Low elastase is a very common finding secondary to H. pylori. But low elastase and digestive insufficiency generally can also predispose a person to H. pylori infection. So we can go both ways but I'll definitely be supporting a level this low to help her digest her food better and to also help prevent recurrence of H. pylori and that bacterial overgrowth once it's been eradicated. The next finding, beta-glucuronidase, is a huge finding for somebody with hormonal symptoms. And for somebody with high estrogen symptoms as well, I will definitely be acting on this value when I'm considering my treatment protocol. Um, fecal occult blood here at zero is right where I like to see it, so I'd like to give that some mention. And moving on down, low secretory IgA here could be multifactorial, multifactorial, excuse me, and this is quite a low level. And so in her case, I would, I would guess that it may be affected by the status of her gut lining health, by nutrient deficiencies, and potentially by long-term stress. I also see it low quite frequently in autoimmunity. I have no concerns with this patient's anti-gliad in IgA. She's following a gluten-free diet, and right here, below 70, is where I'm expecting to see it. Calprotectin here is running a little bit high. I like to see calprotectin below 50, and I don't have any concerns or any worries about this number at 165. But on retest, I do want to see this come down, and I expect it to come down with some work on her dysbiosis and work on her gut terrain. And you may notice that I didn't run zonulin. I often do run zonulin and I find it extremely useful for interpreting difficult cases. In this case, however, I knew ahead of time that I would be doing some gut healing. And, and no matter what the result for zonulin I saw, I would be doing this work. And that's because she has the autoimmunity and signs of poor nutrient absorption. And in my practice, I don't run a test unless it will change my treatment protocol or treatment outcomes. Okay, let's take a look at resistance genes. So here on page five at the top, you'll see the, the H. pylori resistance genes and see that she is clear here. So she's absent for all the genes, which means that any antibiotic therapy you used for the H. pylori would likely be effective, theoretically. And then moving on down the page, I'm also checking off the box on the requisition form to order this universal microbiota resistance genes section. And this can be really, really valuable. So here we see that she does have two genes present that code for resistance to the macro, uh, sorry, the beta-lactam antibiotics and one gene coding for resistance against the macrolides. And so if you are considering antimicrobial, sorry, antibiotic therapy, either triple or quadruple therapy would theoretically work for her H. pylori, but triple therapy may select for resistance within the rest of her microbiota. And that's because the two antibiotics used in triple therapy, amoxicillin and clarithromycin, are a beta-lactam antibiotic and a macrolide, respectively. In this case, however, and in most cases of low-level H. pylori, I'm not using antibiotics. I'm using botanicals. So that's it for the GI map. Lots of interesting findings, and we'll have lots of actionable, actionable findings on that test. So we're not really here to talk about treatment today, but let's talk a little bit about what we did. At our follow-up visit, I showed the patient the results and started talking to her about H. pylori. She gave me a funny look and said, oh, H. pylori, I've already had that before. I had that about five years ago. They gave me antibiotics and it didn't work. So they gave me antibiotics again, and then I felt better. Well, this is a big deal. Remember when I was talking about personal history of H. pylori? This is one of those cases where personal history of H. pylori makes the current H. pylori quite significant. And for somebody who has had two unsuccessful rounds of antibiotics, I would always choose botanicals. So for her, I chose to give mastic gum, dosed nice and high for two months. And I used an H. pylori formula that had DGL and a few other synergistic ingredients. 
because of her hormonal symptoms, I'm deciding to address that beta glucuronidase. And the way I'll do that is by using calcium deglucurate. So I'm hoping this beta glucuronidase value will come down from treating her overgrowth and her gut terrain. But since she has those PMS symptoms, I'd like to help her along with those symptoms while we're working on the gut. I also gave her a nice strong digestive enzyme without HCL. And since she has known history of antibiotic resistance, I asked her to drink a cup of green tea at least once daily and to consume as much raw garlic as possible. And the DGL in that formula will also help with the potential resistance. To help with her thalassemia, I started her on an antioxidant formula to be dosed away from her H. pylori formula. And when my goal is to kill an organism, local oxidative stress is an important part of the process. So I avoid using antioxidant formulae within a few hours of an antimicrobial formula. So within a week, we followed up and her constipation was gone, which was wonderful. Her upper GI pain persisted, but was less severe and less frequent. After two more weeks, her upper GI pain had resolved and her energy had increased dramatically. She was really, really happy with those results. So we followed up again in 60 days. So at our two month follow up, she really thinks she's noticing a definite trend towards more balanced moods premenstrually. She's having less weepy episodes. And instead of 10 days of moods, Premenstrually, she's having maybe one, one to two, maybe three days of low mood premenstrually. So to me, that's a, a sign that we're going in the right direction there. And she was also really happy with that. So retesting. Normally, when H. pylori is my main target on the GI map, I'll treat for two months, then wait six weeks, and then I'll run a standalone H. pylori panel. And then, depending on the results, about three to four months later, after doing some deep terrain work, we'll run another full GI map. If I had seen anything concerning on this test, like a pathogen, high levels of opportunists, occult blood, or high calprotectin, I would be running the full GI map sooner. But in this case, I felt safe just looking at the H. pylori in the short run. So with this patient, we're still in the waiting period between treatment and testing. We'll have an H. pylori panel to look at soon, and then we'll know whether we were successful with our H. pylori treatment. And I've got lots of ideas to add on if the H. pylori is still present, but I like to start very basic with things that I see to be successful over and over and over again, and then add on as needed. In the meantime, we've moved on to a more comprehensive gut healing protocol, and we will continue that until the results for the H. pylori come back. So let's briefly sum up what we discussed about H. pylori. First, Look at the level of H. pylori, even if it isn't flagged red on the test. Sometimes when we look at tests, we are just tuned into the values that are flagged high or low, and we can miss really important findings like low level H. pylori. This doesn't just apply to the H. pylori value. There's a lot of nuance to interpreting GI map results, so looking for functional ranges is always a priority. Next, assess clinical history and other signs on the GI map for possible clinical significance. And just to review, in clinical history, we're looking for upper GI symptoms, autoimmunity, past history with H. pylori, and potentially family members that are being treated for H. pylori or also have high levels. On the GI map, we're looking for virulence factors, dysbiosis, and a low elastase value. After that, decide whether you think the H. pylori is worthy of treatment, and it might not be, and that's okay and work with your patient to determine which treatments are most appropriate for them. And use the antibiotic resistance genes on page five as needed if you are planning to use antibiotics. And lastly, there is no urgency in treating low level H. pylori if you're not convinced that it's contributing to its symptoms. And it's very reasonable to treat what you see on the rest of the test and then come back as needed to treat that H. pylori because it will probably still be there if you don't treat it. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. If you have questions or if you'd like some guidance with your GI map interpretation, please contact customer service and you'll be put in contact with me or one of the other wonderful team members in the medical education team. Have a great day.